終わりってなんだろう終わり終わり終わり終わり終わり終わり終わりってなんだろう In Monster, we know Johan l i e b e r the antagonist in the series Monster, which can manipulate and has crazy charisma that allows him to go along with his plans. How he managed to throw an entire institution into chaos through pure words alone. Let's see how his plans fell into line and how it all lines up. For people that don't understand, maybe after watching slash reading Monster, this is for you. Before we exactly go into the crimes, we have to discuss the start of what Johan was before he became the Monster and see what he did. Also, understanding why the author, specifically in Another Monster, talks about Johan's biggest weakness being Anna. The people wanting Johan to be the top of the world also call Anna bait for Johan and his weakness. Why does Anna forgive Johan? Why does Johan never kill Anna if he was supposed to have it as one of his goals? Why didn't he kill Tenma, for example? And Another Monster also pointing out his biggest weakness being Anna, which Roberto wanted to get rid of for Johan to be, you know, the top guy. So it really calls into question. The perspective of what Johan is to people and how it actually is. Of course, you can actually take into any of this with a grain of salt and come to your own conclusions. However, I will provide counters to anything that may come up to keep supporting any points I made too, but still question it. Johan Liebert was born in a bad situation from a eugenics experiment. After the twins ran away together, the father ended up splitting from her and disappeared. She is put into a hospital to give birth to her children, Johan and Anna. Eventually, Johan's mother runs away to the free frogs. At this point, Johan and Anna would be so scared of the world and always feel oppressed, so you can see why Johan does what he does very soon. Bonaparte and Peter Chapek visit Johan and Anna. The mother has to choose someone, ending up with Anna being thrown into the Red Rose Mansion. After returning with endless torture and trauma, she returns to the free frogs. After Johan hears her story and lets Anna get her pain out, he finally decides to make a plan. This plan involves running away. With their mother gone and not found, Johan has to take action. Otherwise, the people who hurt them will return, aka the monster. The three frogs catch on fire. Assuming Johan did this, or maybe both of them. Either way, they set it on fire and run away. Count that as a crime if you want in his life. Eventually, they meet two old people, a couple. At this point, Johan and Anna should be fine. But when the couple suggests turning these orphans into the police, Johan has no other choice but to kill the couple. This also is the first kill Johan has ever done. This is strategic and methodical, and I'll tell you why. After being in these experiments and running away for a long time, you naturally just want to relax. These are just kids after all. Twins who have a tight bond. They love each other, but it's impossible to relax and be kids when the monster, Bonaparte, goes after them. Run away, so they never have to experience pain again. Johan would never get any satisfaction from killing. He simply has to act like everything is fine after killing them because he never wants Anna to experience what he sees. After already being through a bit of trauma, Johan wants to make sure she never remembers and simply blocks it out. Johan eats the monster from Anna and takes it away with him. But not in a wrong way like that book where he eats her and, you know, kills her or whatever, but metaphorically to the book. Johan has to commit his first kill out of logic. If these people tell the police, it means Bonaparte will likely find them easily. They most likely were adopted by some other people or lived under them until Johan realizes he had to keep running. They kept moving until they eventually end up running to the Shek border, trying as hard as they could to keep moving. As they collapse, General Wolf finds them, and this also leads to Johan going to 501 Kinderheim and Anna to another orphanage. One where Anna will be able to heal, and Johan unfortunately will go into more of his nihilism, as the facility he will go to will be to make the perfect soldiers. However, Johan was already a monster, somebody who had charisma to match leaders, or even better. He can manipulate anyone to do anything due to his understanding of how humans work, which will be brought back later onto how he precisely understands humans. And all this facility did was enhance everything surrounding the monster with Johan. This facility also messed with Johan's memories, so he had some messing around with his brain and how he was kept asleep. Somehow, Johan never wants to forget his sister and his own plans and etc. And there's also a videotape about him saying he didn't want to forget Anna. He had a will to never forget her, and he clearly cares for her in his own way. Under Sleeping Pills, as another monster mentions, Johan hated everything about the facility, most likely because of how Johan already had an idea of adult figures, his mother, and the experimenters. You would see why he'd think of this as trash. While at 501 Kinderheim, he recruits fellow kids, and as he always has said, he has a plan. 
Using the inherent hatred of everyone around him, he managed to cause an uprising and have many killed by just pure words alone. Hatred gathers when people gather together. All I did was pour a little oil on it, and he did, making everything end in chaos. Johan must have also felt mad about how they messed with him and the other children. Of course, both children and adults killed each other. Still, Johan must have seen the outcome of these experiments being pretty horrible, with them only recruiting Kristoff Sinovich. The other people such as Grimmer and Roberto, they must have left before the massacre, at least, or something like that. Johan will eventually unite with Kristoff very soon, however. Being adopted by the Liebets along with Anna, they are under another family. This is where we officially would start Monster. Johan's goal is to protect Anna from all the blood he is spilling, and also because of the monster ever finding them. Every kill has been made methodically and strategically so they can live and leave, so the monster never catches up. The twins are fine for a while, until someone comes to visit, and Bonaparte finds them. Going into the room to check up on them, Johan pretends to sleep just like with Tenma while Bonaparte is talking. He actually never sees his face, but he does hear him. Johan panics. The monster has come, and the monster has come to take them away. He ends up making a mistake and kills the Liebitz and realizes there is no redemption for him. Anna should shoot him now. All he has ever done to her was protect her. But now, after Anna sees him differently, he comes to the realization that he is a more significant threat. And if she runs, she will have a better chance of living a normal life. Johan gets shot after telling Anna how to keep everything clean, so no one would ever know it was her that shot him. Part of the reason Johan was hard to find was his foresight and using a reliable VPN. A reliable VPN service that can guarantee the security of your online activities and grant access to geo-restricted content. Sounds pretty insane, right? Well, it's real. And this VPN service is Atlas VPN. With their advanced VPN technology, you can rest easy knowing that your data is protected from the prying eyes of hackers and cyber criminals. But that's not all. Are you tired of being deprived of certain content due to your location, like I said before? With Atlas VPN, you can effortlessly switch to a different country and unlock a world of entertainment and knowledge. Say goodbye to those frustrating not available in your country messages and hello to a new world of possibilities. And the best part, Atlas VPN is available on all devices so you can enjoy seamless browsing no matter where you are, instantly. Now here's the cherry on top, Atlas VPN is offering an unbeatable deal that you simply cannot miss out on. For only $1.83 per month you can enjoy a free subscription to their stellar service along with free months absolutely free. And in case you are completely not satisfied, Atlas VPN offers a 30 day money back guarantee, ensuring a risk free investment, so why wait? Sign up for Atlas VPN today and experience unparalleled freedom and security online. This is a deal you won't find anywhere else, so grab it while it lasts. As we know, Tenma saves Johan, and Johan repays this kindness from Tenma with killing his three superiors. Unlike people think, Johan is a bit weird with how he expresses himself. After being a monster and doing all of these unethical things and being a kid, he heard Tenma wish death on them, and he repaid it simply. He tells Tenma the same thing when he meets him again years later grown up, and this is the only time where Johan kills out of order for his mission, as he usually killed for Anna, and he's now killed for Tenma. This is the only time, really. If you want to have the interpretation, Johan was some chaotic evil that killed to kill, then look at all the people he killed and look at the connection, and we can all discuss this later. He runs away and grabs Anna once again, after he does all that, and the monster may come because the news, they talked about the twins, and that's where Bonaparte would come again, because they were on the news before him with the Liebets. Johan now sent into his nihilism after his sister passes out seeing him, and this is why Johan cries. You can also consider the photo a trigger for Johan killing them if you want to, even though it was for Tenma. You could think of it as another way the monster could find them if they took a picture. However, you can interpret it as you want. Once they run away, they run into someone called Reinhard Dinger. Saving him from arrest, he decides to thank Johan by giving him and his sister a home for a bit. While they watch the news while eating dinner, Dinger mutters that the world is terrible and that all scum should die. Johan agrees with his statement and says, We don't need those people. This comment sparks Dinger's career as a murderer. He already aligns his pieces perfectly throughout his childhood. Johan leaves Anna in the care of the Fortners. After traveling to Heidelberg, now Johan starts to get his hands dirty, going to different families during his time. And during his time in these families, he meets a blind old man and learns all he can from him, and goes to school at one point too. However, almost like everything except for the old man, this is all erased. This is because the old man was trustworthy because he didn't know his name nor his face. He isn't aware of Johan's face nor actual name, so even though Johan is trying to erase everything that involves his existence and the pain of his sister, which once again we'll get into. 
At age 15, living with his new family, he starts diving into the crime world by starting a money laundering business in the underworld. Based on what we learn, he monopolized all undergrounds, taking dirty money from different syndicates and cleaning it until it was fully legit. Crazy enough, this is almost like a legit bank for the underworld, leading money and making transactions. From age 15 to 20 years old or five years into the business, it made tons of money and from what we hear, it was millions. And at some point too, Johan stays with Carl Newman's mother, most likely due to the information we hear, so who knows, but assuming that he did, then he would have learned some information about Shuvolt maybe, and that's probably how he learned the economic, but he also was based in the economical world already, so who knows. Around this time, Johan hires serial killers in Germany to kill off Johan's previous parents, wiping out his existence. Anyone who has seen Johan needs to die. And this is why Roberto says to Eva Heinemann that if you've seen Johan, then you need to die. After a while, Johan gets bored or something and leaves and lets the entire business fall. And the people that had money or wanted it end up killing each other later in the year. The question here is, why does Johan make this money laundering business? And exactly what's the point in general? The point is one obvious one, being money leads to power, and not power in just how much money you can spend on horrific deeds hiring killers, or whatnot, but it buys you connections that you get from the power. Johan of course needed money to be independent enough to move, and probably buy stuff that involves his plans, but he needed to meet the top people. Having this power allows him to find different organizations like the baby, and the people like traffic too, radicals, etc. He's able to meet these people, and a way to get rid of them all eventually, being connected to people that was involved with the Red Rose Mansion, even though he destroyed it later on. This was the point, and this all aligns to his plans, such as placing people like Christoph in the apprentice role and politician. And those serial killers, such as Adolf Junkers and two others, end up being hunted down by Johann Liebert. He betrays them, and Adolf Junkers gets warned by his group that they had been hired by a monster. Getting hit by a car, but being rescued by Dr. Tenma, eventually he is called by Johann, and Johann makes him paranoid, and he ends up with him. After many years, Dr. Kenzo Tenma meets Johann again. Johann kills Junkers, and then tells Tenma not to get involved, and he shouldn't know what happened to the Liebets nor him. I initially thought that Johann framed Tenma, but no, it was generally more of an indirect frame due to Ava and other people being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Because Johan himself at this point is a non-existent human being, and this is proven when Lungay tries to go into psychology like how he does for every criminal, aka the I am the killer mind state, saying, I am Johan, I am Johan Lieben. After he says that, he concludes, I don't exist. Because of this exact reason, you can see how Johan can just seem like he was never there, because all he does is erase any existence. Lungay checking the room he stayed at, and it was almost like anyone was never in here. It was almost inevitable for someone like Tenma, who happened to be where Johan was, and one of the only ones to know of his existence, to be framed and suspected. It wasn't Lungay being dumb or any other character, it was generally impossible due to how Johan could be moving without being noticed. After Johan finally meets Tenma, Johan executes Junkers in front of Tenma and walks away, revealing his face, the face of someone unsuspecting and kind. This year, both Anna and Johan are 20 years old. Johan goes to meet Anna. And this is where some questioning is required, on the actual purpose of Johan killing the Fortners and why he wanted to meet Anna in the castle in Heidelberg. First time seeing Anna, now known as Nina, has basically forgotten her past. Any of the tragedies before are gone. She leaves a modest life and is happy with her family, studies, and outside hobbies. So why does Johan let her heal from all of this and that that was the best for Anna, but still removes the happiness and kills the Fortners? Would you call it Johan being generally evil and give her happiness then remove it to torture her? Or would it be just because Johan was making sure that Anna wouldn't remember her past? Her true identity? Why is Anna named Nina by the Fortners? This calls into question that all of this was was a way to make her forget the trauma. But yet it's possible she might have learned about her past. And it's interesting to be honest. The manga shows right here with the Fortners deciding if to tell her about her actual identity. Johan must have told them to change her name because of his goal of removing all she knew about him and her past. Another monster talks about how Johan loved Anna. Johan is someone who has only been raised in the dark and never really saw the light. He has had good intentions, but there are always ways he does things that are abnormal, but simply have to be done. Johan only knows what he knows, and when he was a child, killing the Liebets was a simple emotional response from him, realizing his plan had failed and the monster had found them. He was a child that had to take the burden of surviving and doing anything to protect his sister. Johan as a kid is so bitter by his mother's decision because he saw his mother choose. Everything is yours, he says to Anna. Everything she will ever do, anything she does, he will unconditionally love her. 
Johan doesn't hate Anna for her views on him. He is only affected by a self-esteem type of view. Like when he cries seeing his sister not having a good response seeing him. He isn't angry at her, he's just his self-esteem has went down. And this is where the criminal mind of Johan comes from. It's not a typical Joker chaotic loves killing gets real from everything he does type beat or evil just for evil, psychopath, psychopath, blah blah blah. No, it's not like that at all. While doing everything to protect her and not make the same mistake as their mother, Johan does it in a way that will most likely hurt Anna because it's a scenario where he isn't exactly considering what she thinks. So while being selfless, he's also being selfish and not thinking of her feelings, but he still does what he has to be doing for her safety. Either way, Johan kills the Fortners by hiring some corrupt cops. Johan most likely anticipated that her parents tell her, or the other scenario is that Johan is trying to have Anna move from where she is because she could be in danger. Due to the knowledge of Johan's weakness, anyone that wants to control him, all they need to do is get to Anna. Johan wanted to meet her, most likely to move her to a different place for her safety, similar to how he moved Anna in the hospital. I suggest you reread or watch Monster and notice the patterns of when Anna is held captive, along with other points. Johan takes the role of the monster, and along with his nihilism to some extent, because obviously the whole idea of meaninglessness and his actions align with different goals and desires. Anyway, he's a little nihilistic in terms of the value of others and his view of his own value. And even if he was actually nihilistic, you know, whatever, he would have just enacted his plan on taking down the economy and actually just kill Shuvol. He does the immoral stuff, he does, so let's not forget all of that, of course but it's for a reason. I want to highlight that and we'll keep talking about it until you understand it. And another monster is a definite read too to understand this. Onwards in the story, Johan targets the Neo guys guys and goes for them. These guys want him to become the next guy guy. Y yeah. Around here, Anna slash Nina ends up tracking down someone called the baby, trying to get the organization's attention acting as some girl. Instead, she ends up getting caught and quote unquote, which reports what I've been saying, Nina is bait for Johan. This is why in another monster, Roberto wanted to erase Nina's existence because she was a weakness for Johan. After being captured and talking to someone named Giedlitz, leaving to go somewhere else, this ends up catching Johan's attention. Johan kills Giedlitz and his henchmen later on, leaving a message for Tenma and Nina and how the monster inside him is exploding. And from their point of view, it's Johan playing around with them with the self-inserted line by others that he sees others as ants. With this perspective, you can see it as someone either having a breakdown or trolling. But how this could actually be interpreted with the knowledge we have beforehand is it's actually help the monster is exploding inside of me. Johan has become a monster and he is playing the role and taking that role from Nina, which should have became the monster back in the Red Rose Mansion. The person who went to the Red Rose Mansion and was chosen was respected by many when they came out. So when Nina slash Anna is introduced to everyone, they speak highly. Ah, so this is the person. Which is what they've seen so far should be related to Johan, but instead it was to Anna. So Johan, like the book, you could say ate the monster from Anna. This could be hinted from Nina slash Anna's own outburst when being taught to Dr. Richwin, acting like some crazy psycho trying to kill him. That's almost like the monster she should have been, but Johan took it with him. The next part is where we start to see this criminal genius or manipulative side of Johan really do its work. The closing in on Shuvolt is the only time in the series you get to see so much Johan in a big window of time, being able to now actually dissect his behavior with normal people, as he is posing as a student here, and his plans revolving around the economic giant, Hans Schuvel. The initial plan is to take out Schuvel, who has control over the economy in Germany. This is why many say that Johan quote unquote took over Germany or bent Germany to its knees, when to be honest this definitely could have happened, but it didn't but we'll go over the plan before it changed way later on, and we'll discuss why he changed it. Johan manipulates different killers to kill people close to Shuval. He slowly does it, and he loses a lot of people around him. This is so he can completely isolate Shuval. With Shuval now isolated, and alone, he can act his plans. You'll notice that Johan likes to isolate people that he closes on in. I'd say similar to this, and this like little parallel, I guess, General Wolf, but with him, he was trying to have it so no one really knew he was General Wolf, basically sucking his entire soul away and that there was nothing left of his identity. No one to call his name. But with manipulation and Johan's way of doing it, it involves isolation, and you'll see this further on. Johan first starts trying to get close to Shuvolt, something that could have been done easily already by him by being someone that reads to Shuvolt, being known as the Thursday boy. However, this would never be enough, and at most he could just be the assistant, but he has to gain the trust, so there is one way to do this. To really get close to Shuvolt would be family. Turns out Shuvolt's son has been something that is very important as to do some issues in the family, it got split up, blah blah blah, and with a fake son, Johan Plants, he is already starting to close in on him. 
how the real son comes into the picture and ends up being revealed, causing Johan to change his plans, ending up with a fake son being killed. With this fake son being named Edmund Farren, a detective ends up getting hired to look into this death. With him eventually lining up to Johan, which is something not a lot of people give for his intelligence, he manages to link deaths that should be just random to actual patterns and a logical line of method, with him concluding that he was killing people around Shuvold to completely isolate him. Someone doing this without having any knowledge of Johan Pry is pretty impressive, and being able to do this and figure it out, and being able to figure out this, Johan responds to this investigation by going at him directly. Johan actually tries killing him at first, but all of these fail and he ends up going himself to put a stop to his snooping around. Masking his true intentions under the guise of a kind, warm, and just a student researching for his papers, he asks questions for his research. Johan studies under law in the college, so this is actually a good way for him to do this under the guise of studying. As they talk, Johan eventually ends up jabbing at him a bit more, discussing his past guilt and failure, shooting a young man aged 17, Stefan Jos, who was from a bad orphanage named 501 Kinderheim, then strategically relating this to his daughter right after he says all that, who he was supposed to see later. This is basically how you're supposed to see someone as young as he was, which he does later when he reveals the truth about Richard, but he still does it very subtly. He plants pressure in the seed of doubt, leading it to a point of hitting different emotions of Richard. He also strategically changes the area of where he is doing it, going to a deserted rooftop changing the environment where they are alone. This then leads Johan to revealing the truth of Richard. Richard killed that young man and claims it was just because he was drunk. However, Johan reveals that he did it while he was sober. He wanted to shoot him. How can someone like that meet with his daughter with that type of sin? This right here is a pure masterclass of Johan's manipulation. He isolates him to a place of thinking which is impossible to escape. With only getting pushback from Johan, he can't actually rationalize what Johan is doing, playing on his guilt, and Johan mocking him low-key pulls out a bottle, well, would you like to drink? After Richard mysteriously dies, I assume this was actually him erasing himself instead of Johan pushing him or shooting him, due to the whole point of the scene, seeing how Johan kills someone with just pure words alone. Now, I hear these interpretations on the whole purpose of erasing Richard from the chessboard. I say chessboard because this is all strategy. Richard is in the way, so he has to try and get rid of him, and he initially tries to kill him but fails two times, so he ends up going himself. That is the most reliable, of course. Then we have another interpretation. With that goal in mind still, and it still is in this second interpretation, Johan finds this to be justice deserving somewhat. We see Johan has an affinity with children. Obviously he can communicate with them well because he is an orphan who was subjugated to so much torture, and he felt a tiny bit of a grudge as Richard kills Stefan Jos, willingly. Someone who couldn't control his circumstances of his childhood and was in 501 Kinderheim, an institution who would ruin any child. I say this based on the smile subtly that Johan has during the entire counter, in the manga, and it looks very deceiving and kind at the same time. Anime makes this look very evil looking and all that stuff, but manga has the expressions down, and it's the original source, but I base it off he may like it to some extent. That's just a theory though, but those are the interpretations, and the second interpretation still has interpretation 1 in it. I just wanted to add a bit of reason why Johan might have been enjoying it somewhat. Being able to reunite Shuvalt's son, which was Carl, quote unquote, Shuvalt says, Johan is somebody that he can trust, and beforehand, he said that Johan was worthy to become the next Shuvalt, his position. Now being able to gain the trust of Shuvalt and reunite his son, which was Carl, becoming his secretary, because of this knowledge of economics, and for example, if Shuvalt goes or leaves his position, Johan is next. And because of this, Johan's next scheme revolves around Shuvalt's own plan to sell his library of books, a donation basically. He will kill Shuvalt and steal his position, having a giant hand over all of Germany. And we can soon discuss why this was his initial plan, and no, it's not Johan wants to take over Germany for fun or wanting all power because he is hungry, none of that. However, before that, Johan was in the library with Shuvalt looking for a book for his friend. While going along the books, he finds a book named The Nameless Monster. Reading this, Johan falls down in shock and has a PTSD sort of attack while also crying, killing the blue Sophie Faker and saying that he is no longer interested in Shuvalt and he displays this by completely changing the plan that Roberto had in mind where he would shoot Shuvalt, however Johan just set the entire place on fire. We assume this is based on him learning of Bonaparte, once again from the book, and remembering his childhood a bit more, with 501 Kinderheim ruining his memories, which in quote unquote says, like I said before, please don't let me forget Anna, so basically someone important. Now with this knowledge in mind, he sets his sight on Bonaparte to erase him, as he had the perfect suicide planned already, and he will now get Bonaparte involved with this too. Erase everything that had hurt him and Anna. Anna had also been hurt by him, so he will have to erase himself. 
as originally becoming the top guy in Germany was so he could prevent and control all the people that would have made the Red Rose Mansion, etc. So having all that power would keep Anna safe. However, as he changes his plan, he keeps Shuvalt alive, most likely a payment to Carl, someone who he considered a friend. And you can believe that or not, and I'll tell you why now. Based on his crying and care to leave Shuvalt alive for Carl, to live with him for the rest of his days, Johan and Carl are people who are similar, being moved from different places and being away from their real parents. Johan sympathizes with him and actually cries for him. This isn't manipulative at all. All of the tears Johan sheds in the series are real. Meeting Anna again in the hospital, Carl, and reading The Nameless Monster are all real. In Another Monster 2, which I keep referencing as it was made by Urasawa to tell you what happened after Monster and explain stuff. Carl himself, when being interviewed, says he doesn't hate Johan at all and believes his tears to be real. They were utterly true and heartfelt. That experience prevented him from ever hating Johan. Now, this part of the arc, Johan dresses up as his sister and calls himself Anna, which is actually interesting considering she's known as Nina now, and at the end of the series. So using this alias, who the Anna back then is now Nina, Anna being dead, or Nina's own self being gone. Johan uses this alias and goes around Prague, masquerading as her. His aim is to get hold of the tape that the 501 Kinderheim headmasters had recorded. Johan also talks to a kid, which ends up having his own twisted view which goes on to the child. You have to remember, while Johan was the guy who took it all for Anna, he did also become the monster, and what he does, you know, it's kind of unethical. Him talking to Milos here was him talking to himself. Who wanted you? He's not saying that to him. He's saying it to himself. He's like internalizing stuff. A lot of people pick this up when I watch some reactions or whatever to the scene. But Johan is basically saying, go out into the world, look for your mother, and if you don't find her, then no one wanted you. However, Grimmer later steps in hugging him and saving him, giving him love. Something which stops all of this tragedy. We will discuss the theme of love very soon. Johan also burns down the Red Rose Mansion. He leaves Chapik alive, but he does die later on. Johan clears out all the people that know him, along with his faithful servants, like Horsemen, revealed to have killed many people for Johan, ending his life, then going on to the town where Bonaparte should be. Johan now will die, having Tenma kill him. However, as he is about to do it, Anna comes to him. I say the name Anna because it's like a realization of her past, so I'll refer to her as Anna. No one really talks about this, but why does Anna forgive Johan suddenly? It's because of all that I have mentioned prior, she realized. Realizing this at the art house where all the pictures were, she remembers that Johan was actually crying when the Liebitz died. The mangaka doesn't show a picture of this, and the anime doesn't do it either. And also during the entire series, that one scene that we always see was the image of what Anna thinks she saw. So we actually never see an unbiased perspective. Johan clearly did a lot of wrong, but this was necessary, almost like a Machiavellian type role he took on. He would do anything for his sister and take on the burden of becoming that monster and unironically being selfish and selfless at the same time, as he had hurt Anna many times, while also sacrificing his own humanity. However, at the end of the series, learning of his real name from Tenma and leaving the hospital bed, his humanity remains. No longer a nameless monster, with a well-lit room, and no longer someone that apparently had no existence, as stated by Lunge when looking at the room that he stayed in and concluding his mentality as someone that doesn't exist. In another monster, it states that after the Munich library burning, Johan went on a journey to become human. At the end of the day, even though he took the role of a monster, he was still human. It was just a role after all. And as humans do, they have flaws. His flaw was his ideology. The ideology that got disproven when Tenma didn't kill him, as his plan had failed, and how he truly was wrong about the world and people. This is shown as Tenma never turned into a monster. While Johan had a grasp on how to manipulate the dark nature in people's hearts, there were cases where general humans and monster weren't like that. With someone who had been brought into the world just surrounded with darkness and a childish view, he didn't think that not everyone is like this. He would be proven right if Tenma killed him, because that's how it should be. But it's not. People like Grimmer and all talk about love. Love is what is shown during the series, contrasting the darkness of the manga. We see Tenma experience different kind of people along his journey. Where he was supposed to become a monster, defeat a monster, to defeat the monster was actually just to give him love. Johan had turned into a state of hesitation when Anna had forgiven him, something that he thought he would never get again after the incident at the Liebitz house. Just as the magnificent Steiner, he must have became human in the end. How Johan manipulates people as apparent dark manipulation is true, but another monster highlights that Johan was able to bring so much influence and charisma to people because he simply could understand everyone. He became the person who would listen to their problems and never downplay their experiences. He gave them a reassurance and acknowledging of their existence and value to the world, never frowning on them, but giving them someone like a friend, and that they would never be alone. With evil people, he did the same, 
However, he took it back and drove them to a dark pit, isolating, and would then ask them for a little simple favor. Johan never killed for a sick desire, as another monster highlights, and it's just something he simply had to do, and in the end of the story, being proven wrong, he went to live his life. The criminal mind of Johan is someone who had to kill. He is able to be charismatic, go into disguise, and understand humans to a level to manipulate them. However, this worldview could only work on a few people, and still in the end, he became not a nameless monster, but a human being. I'll leave links in the description to some of the posts that helped me realize this. Go check it out because someone else's interpretation helps you make an informed opinion. Gathering all those, you'll make some logical decision. And I looked over everything I had and this was the most logical. It makes Johan even more deep than we all thought.